evening, everyone. Welcome to the virtual Glencoe Public Library. My name is Grace Hayek, and we have tonight with us um, Amy Stanley. She is um, going to talk to us about her brand new book, Stranger in the Shogun City. Um, let me tell you a little bit of, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, I too. <laughs> First of all, I want to tell everyone that, that this, this event is recorded. Um, so if you know anybody who wants to, who misses it, missed it and would like to see it, um, in a few days, we'll have it up on the library's YouTube channel. Um, so thank you very much, Ms. Stanley, for, for letting us do that. Um, professor Stanley is a um, professor of Asian history and global history at Northwestern University. Um, she, her themes, thematic fields are urban history, gender and sexuality history, and her principal research interests are early and modern, early modern and modern Japan. Uh, she is a PhD from Harvard, 2007. And um, her first book, book is titled Selling Women, Prostitution, Households, and the Market in Early Modern Japan. And it explored how, how an expanding market for sex transformed the J Japanese economy and changed women's lives in the years between 1600 and 1868. She's also written about adultery in the Edo period, education for geisha in the first years of, years of the Meiji. Is it Meiji? Made here, and the figure of the migrant maidservant in global history. Um, she teaches undergraduate and graduate courses on Japan before the 20th century, early modern global history, and women's and gender history. Uh, she has an NEH faculty fellowship, sorry, she had one in 2015-2016, and is a got the Distinguished Teaching Award in 2012 from the Weinberg uh, College of Arts and Sciences. Um, so as you can see, you're in very good company. We are going to um, enjoy some lovely slides along with her talk, and I will hand it over to you, Amy. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you everyone for being here today to hear me talk about my new book, Stranger in the Shogun City, which came out from Scribner in July. Um, we already showed you a copy, but I will show it to you again, just in case you want to see it. Um, I wish that I could be with you in Glencoe or wherever it is you are. I'm talking to you from Evanston, so just a few miles away, but um, I hope that we will all be able to see each other in person when this is all over. So to begin today, to talk to you about my book, I want to take you back in time and not to the early 19th century, which is where I usually go, which is where this book is set, but just back to about 2009, when I was starting out as a faculty member at Northwestern in the history department. And I was assigned for the very first time to teach my favorite subject, which is the history of early modern Japan. And we define that as between 1600 and 1868. And I was really excited about this assignment, uh, but I realized that I didn't have enough of the materials that I wanted to assign to my students, because I'm really somebody who's very interested in the history of everyday life, um, what things were like for women, for farmers, what things were like in villages, and I didn't have enough of those materials. So I was clicking around, looking for something that I could translate myself and assign to my undergraduates. And I will show you what I found. So I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get to my PowerPoint. So I was clicking around on the internet and I found the homepage of the Niigata Prefectural Archives where I had done some work before. And I found this little um, link to the Internet do Komonjo Koza, which just means the internet document reading course. And I clicked on it and I found something absolutely wonderful. So when I clicked on this, there are a bunch of different documents that the library was, or the archive was making available to the public. And they would show like an image of the document and then they would have a transcription of the document and then they would explain what was so great about it with this idea that this would encourage members of the public to come to the Niigata Prefectural Archives and see what the archive had. Now, Niigata, I'm going to show you in a minute, um, is on the Japan Sea coast. So it is about two and a half hours away from Tokyo by um, bullet train. So here you have Tokyo, right? And then you have to go all the way up here to get to Niigata, where the Niigata Prefectural Archives are. 
I wasn't there. I was in my office in Evanston, clicking through their website. And I clicked on um, episode 12 of the internet document reading course. And I found something amazing that absolutely blew me away. And it was a letter from a woman named Tsuneno who was living in Edo, which is the old name for what is now the city of Tokyo. And she was writing in 1840. And the letter was addressed to her mother who was back in the countryside um, in this part of Niigata right here. And this is what this letter looks like. Now, at the time, I had no ability to read this letter whatsoever. I could read 19th century Japanese, which is a little different from modern Japanese. I can speak modern Japanese, um, but this is handwriting that I absolutely could not decipher. So this looked to me like squiggles, like it probably might look to you. But luckily, the archive included a transcription. So putting these squiggles into identifiable characters. And from that transcription, I was able to work out a rough trans translation of what this letter said. So this is my translation. And it started to mother at Rinsenji, which I'll explain in a minute, from Tsunino, confidential. I'm writing the spring greetings. As you know, I went to Kanda Minagawa Cho in Edo quite unexpectedly, and I ended up in so much trouble. And from there, I was absolutely transfixed by this woman's voice because she was writing so clearly and so directly about her experience. She even said, um, the food here is great. Everything I eat is delicious. And to me, she sounded just like me when I was a sophomore in college, writing home from my first trip to Tokyo in 1997. So this voice absolutely grabbed me and I fell in love. And I decided I needed to know everything there was to know about this woman and this letter. Now, luckily, in their explanation, the archive had said they had about 100 other letters in the collection that had to do with this woman and her adventures. So as soon as I could, I flew from O'Hare to Tokyo and then I took the train up to Niigata to go to the archives and to see and take pictures of these letters for myself. The archive in their synopsis of Tsuneno's life said that she had been divorced and run away from her village and that ultimately she had ended up in the service of a very famous Edo samurai. And so this in itself was intriguing and allowed me as I was standing there kind of taking all these photos of these letters, which I absolutely could not read, to imagine that there might be a story, a really great story lurking in these letters. So it wasn't now just the voice, but it was also the larger arc of this woman's life that I found really intriguing. Now, it was completely hopeless reading them. I could not read them at all. And I had to think to myself, as I'm sitting in this archive taking pictures of all these letters, that what I was doing was completely hopeless, um, that I was wasting my research money, that I was wasting my time, and that I was going to end up back home in Evanston with pictures that I had absolutely no idea what they were. To make matters worse, over the next two years, um, I was working full time, and I had a baby. And then a few years after that, I had another baby. So I was very busy, but that original voice in that letter just would not let me go. And I returned to these letters again and again, trying to teach myself how to read Sunino's handwriting, sounding out every single word. Now, in order to do this, you need a special kind of dictionary that will allow you to decipher the scribbles and turn them into what look like comprehensible Japanese characters. So this is a picture of my dictionary. Um, and that is my younger son, Henry, when he was about two years old, um, pretending that he was reading my dictionary. And this gives you some sense of what my life was like. I had this, these kids, then I had my dictionary, and I was constantly toggling between them. And eventually I wore the dictionary out and the pages ended up on my kitchen floor and in the diaper bag and all over the place. Um, but I was absolutely obsessed with trying to figure out what these letters said. Eventually, this dictionary um, that you can see in this picture got completely worn out, and so I had to fix it all with tape. But I did um, eventually figure out how to read her handwriting, and then also how to read a bunch of the other letters and other kinds of documents that were in the collection. And they all look different because everybody was writing in their own style with their own handwriting. So these are some pictures of the letters that I found. Um, and these are some household diaries and records of expenses. 
And these are inventories, um, things like shopping lists, right, that have um, just enumerated lists. And then there were also maps. So these are maps of the village that this woman came from. And I was able to eventually learn Tsuneno's story and to retrace her steps. So I went back to Japan over and over again um, and to understand her motivations, why she left her village, what she meant when she was writing to her mother. And I wrote compulsively, sometimes on my phone, sometimes while rocking the babies to sleep, sometimes in the middle of chaotic birthday parties. Um, if you're familiar with the Little Beans in Evanston, which is an indoor play area, I wrote uh, the scene of Tsuneno's death while sitting in the um, table by the ninja course. I was very busy, but I couldn't stop writing because I felt almost like I was being haunted by a very stubborn, very obsessive 19th century ghost. And the result of that 10 years of research and that complete obsession is the book that I'm here to talk about today. So the book tells the story of Tsuneno. Oh, this is the picture that I want to show you before that I got distracted and I couldn't show you, but I showed you the nice version of the dictionary when my, um, when my toddler had it. And this is what ended up happening to the dictionary, which is it got completely destroyed and it ended up on the chair next to my dog. Um, so in any, any case, I'm not trying to show you my destroyed dictionary right now trying to tell you the story of Tsuneno, um, which is also, as I said, a story about Japan in the first half of the 19th century. So this is a book um, about how an ordinary woman struggled to make her own life, um, much in the way that we ordinary women now, and this is me in Tsuneno's village, struggle to make our own lives. Um, it's about how people break from what's expected of them and recently I've also come to realize it's about what it felt like to live at a time when it seems like the world you've known all of your life that your parents and your grandparents have known is crumbling. Sunino was born in 1804 and she died in 1853, which was the same year that Admiral Perry's, um, Commodore Perry's black ship, so the American um, Navy came to quote unquote open Japan. And that changed the country forever. Tsuneno came from a tiny village called Ishigami, which was in the heart of Japan's snow country. So you remember I showed you before the map of Niigata. So there's the city of Niigata today, um, which was also the city of Niigata back then. And then she came from this little village down here called Ishigami. Ishigami um, was the kind of place where people spent the winters inside, huddled in smoky and dimly lit rooms. It was the kind of place where the snow whipped across the field so fast in the winter that people were completely whited out and could not see where they were going. The old people said that it was freezing from equinox to equinox. And during the long winters, it was difficult for letters and packages to get in or out. Horses couldn't be used because they could get stuck up to their bellies in snow. And if a special message from the Shogun came through, and the mountain passes were impassable. They would actually send out laborers with heavy shoes like clogs to stomp down the snowdrifts so that the messengers could get through. Um, this is an illustration from a very famous book at the time. Um, it's been translated into English under the name Snow Country Tales. And this was a book about this area of where Tsuneno grew up called Echigo, um, trying to explain to people in Edo, which is now the city of Tokyo, how much it snowed in Echigo. And so they would show um, laborers, for example, clearing away the snowdrifts. And they would give you an exam examples, um, the author would give the readers examples of these things called snowshoes, um, and also the kind of straw snow coats that people would wear, and also the wooden shovels. So it's as if somebody from like very northern Wisconsin was trying to explain to somebody in Washington DC what it gets like there in the winter, except that Echigo was even snowier than northern Wisconsin. Tsuneno's father, Emon, was the head priest at a Buddhist temple called Rinsenji. And Tsuneno was fortunate to have a much easier life than most of her neighbors who were spending their whole winters doing things like digging themselves out of the snow. Her family was prosperous. They collected contributions from their work as village priests. And they also lent money to, village, uh, to nearby peasants. So Tsuneno had a life that was much like any other well-bred girl in 
Echigo's snow country. She learned to read and write alongside her older brother, Yi Yu. She also learned how to sew. She learned the contours of her village, the trees in the forests, the ducks on the pond. In winter, she learned to build snow forts and walk in snowshoes and to climb to the top of the mounds of snow that people used to pile up in the streets and in the courtyards because it snowed so much that the roofs would collapse if people didn't go up to the roof every night and shovel the snow into the street or into the courtyard. And Suneno also learned as a child what was expected of her in the future. As the popular textbook, The Greater Learning for Women said, to be a woman is to leave home and get married. It admitted no other possibility. So when Suneo was only 12 years old, this is exactly what happened to her. She was sent away with a huge trousseau full of clothes and furniture to the distant Northern province of Dewa. So she was here um, in this part of Niigata, in this part of Echigo, and she was sent at the age of 12 all the way up here um, to this town of Oishida. And her husband, her new husband, uh, had a temple in this city, in this town of Oishida. This is what people did in Oishida, um, or at least in the countryside outside of this town. They made um, safflowers. So they grew safflowers and harvested them, and then they processed them and eventually turned them into dye. So this whole area is known for these fields of vivid gold that surround the river town. And in the river town, there was this temple, Joganji, which amazingly is still there. So this is not the original building itself, but some of these things like the gravestones, um, the storehouse, the bell, those are the original features of these, this temple as they would have looked in the early 19th century when Suneno went there as a 12 year old bride. Her husband was the head priest at this temple. So this wasn't a bad life for Tsunino. It was the best her parents could do, a prosperous temple in a medium-sized town. They knew the family, they knew the husband. So this is some idea of what Tsunino's life was supposed to be like. She was supposed to marry a priest and she was supposed to go on to have a very conventional life much like her mother's. But that first marriage at Joganji only lasted for 15 years and Tsunino was sent home with a letter of divorce. The divorce was amicable. Her husband remained friendly with her family, but it was a definite ending. Tsunero had lived in Oishida for over half her life at that point. She had attended 15 years of festivals and memorials and readings from Buddhist holy texts called sutras. She had learned her parishioners' names. There were over a hundred of them. She had greeted their children. She had offered condolences at their funerals. All those people had been her husband's responsibility and also hers. She had mastered the routines of this household, which changed with the seasons. She'd rushed around before the new year with frozen breath and aching hands in the early mornings. She'd listened to rain on the spring nights when the river, which ran through this river town, would get so fast and so swollen that you could hear it from the temple. Um, and this I know because I visited the temple and I know that it's only footsteps from the big Mogami River. She probably accepted gifts of summer vegetables on still days when the birds stood still in the fields. She greeted unexpected visitors, she left on trips, and she managed all kinds of domestic catastrophes. But those were memories after her divorce. And after that 15 years, she would never go back. The only thing for her to do, unless she wanted to live in her parents' house forever, was marry again. But this time, her brother, her older brother, Gi Yu, was in charge of the household. And he actually made a quite good match for her. She would be married to a peasant, a prosperous peasant, this time much nearer by. So he sent her from Ishigami village, which is where she was born and spent her first 10 years, all over here to Oshima village, which is just a little bit more in the mountains than Ishigami, which is still on the plain. You have to imagine the mountains are kind of all in here. But unfortunately for Tsunino, this second marriage coincided with a disastrous famine. Um, so in 1836, after three bad harvests in a row, a village headman just a few miles away from her new home in Oshima panicked. 
and he wrote this very long account of the famine, which he hoped to leave to um, his descendants. He said that it was for his grandchildren and their children to understand this horrible famine that had happened to ensure that they would never let such a thing happen again. He said that out of 135 families in his village, 73 of them had no food. They could try to forage mountain vegetables, kudzu, reeds, and water oats, but in early spring there were still nearly 10 feet of snow on the ground, and late thaw would make it impossible for them to gather new leaves in time to stave off starvation. Meanwhile, the families who still had enough to eat had nothing to give them. At planting time, peasants wouldn't have the money to redeem all the farming tools that they had pawned to get money so that they could eat during the winter. And even if they didn't eat their seed rice, they wouldn't be able to plant because they had no tools. And it seemed to him as though half the village would starve to death. The following year, in 1837, the region as a whole would see the annual death rate nearly triple. And if you think about that in terms of our present crisis, I think the hardest hit areas um, right now in the United States saw in a month the death rate increase by about 20%. This is the death rate tripling. It was absolutely a catastrophe. And Sunino, like many other recent brides, was divorced, left to make her way back through the haunted, broken countryside and back to her home at Vincenji. Amazingly, Sunino's older brother managed to marry her off yet again. Um, and right away, he has received four different proposals. So this tells you there's something interesting about this woman that even after two divorces, so many men still wanted to marry her. It could have been her family and her family's money, or it could have been something about her or her personality. We don't know. But unfortunately, like the previous two marriages, that third marriage didn't last either. In fact, it was barely five months before she was sent home. And so Tsunino was now divorced three times at the age of 34 in 1838. Her brother was undaunted by this. He made plans to marry her again for a fourth time to a widower who might not mind having an older, probably somewhat opinionated bride. But Suneno just could not abide that idea. She wouldn't stand for it. If I stayed at home, Suneno wrote later, they were talking about sending me away to a terrible place to marry a widower. I was terrified, but I didn't want to marry a widower. I was being forced into something that I absolutely refused to do. She turned down every single proposal that her family received. Later, she described her resistance as a wooden door reinforced with metal, something that was far stronger than it looked. In fact, Suneno had another plan. She wanted to go to the big city of Edo, she told everyone she knew that she wanted to go, but her family would never let her leave. Finally, a man of her acquaintance, a junior priest named Chikan, took her seriously. He said that he had family in Edo and he'd take her there and it would be no trouble at all. She left home saying that she was going to visit one of her older brothers nearby. And instead she met Chikan on a bridge in the castle town of Takada. So this is the castle town of Takada. Um, there's still a castle there that you can go visit and this is its moat. And she met Chikan on a bridge over here in Shimogomachi. Chikan said he was about to go to Edo right away. And Sunino said that she didn't want to go yet. He said, that's ridiculous. You can pawn the clothes you're carrying for travel money and we can just go right now. Later, she said, he spoke to me so kindly as if I were a younger sister. But at the time she stood on the bridge in Shimogomachi and Shimogomachi is a place where you can still see some traditional architecture. Um, it was a post station, um, which means it's a place where there were a lot of travelers and pack horses, a place with a lot of people passing through. So she stood on this bridge and a few blocks to the south, one of her brothers was waiting with his wife and family, expecting her any minute. To the west was her home, the temple, the Insenji, her family, the endless conversations about marriage, an existence that had become intolerable for her. Surrounding her were these inns and shops of Takada. Pack horses and travelers crossed the bridge, everyone was somewhere to go. And beyond them was the northeastern countryside, the fields and mountains where she had spent her entire life. 
I imagine that she must have considered her past in that moment. 35 years of tar black nights, blinding sunshine on snow, and thick icicles like giant white radishes hanging to dry. How many more years did she have left? And so she handed over her clothes to Chikan, and he found a man to take them to a pawn shop. And then they left. They went down the highway, past Mount Myoko, which was the furthest highest peak on the horizon of her childhood, and they headed to the great city of Edo. Sunino's experience in Edo, this big crowded metropolis, is at the heart of my book. Now, most of you are probably familiar with Tokyo. Far fewer people in the United States have ever heard of Edo, which is just the old name for the city. But in 1800, Edo had 1.2 million people, far more than London's approximately 800,000, and about on par with Beijing's 1.1 million. Then, as now, it was probably the biggest metropolitan area in the world. And as Sunino was about to discover, it was not an easy place to live. So here I'm going to read a little bit about, from the book about her experience in Edo. And I'm going to show you also some images, um, some of them from textbooks and some of them from museum exhibitions and other recreations about what life was like in Edo's tenements. So with no money and no immediate prospect of a job, Sunino couldn't do much on her first days in Edo. It was hard enough just to get her bearings. From the main streets of Inner Kanda, the neighborhood where she is landed, the order of the city was comprehensible. It looked more or less like it did on printed maps, a series of blocks divided from one another by gates and fencing. But the back alleys were different, dark and unpredictable, as if the passages between the store's facades led to an entirely different world. Sunino walked down pathways so narrow that the eaves of facing buildings nearly touched. Two adults could pass one another, but if one of them happened to be a peddler with baskets slung over his shoulders, then the other one would have to step aside. Below her feet, uneven flagstones were set into packed dirt. Along the row houses, sliding door followed sliding door. On walls and gates, there was a confusing proliferation of signs. Um, so this is a modern picture, so everything looks clean um, and blank. But in the Edo period, there would have been all kinds of signs pasted up on these walls um, and on these um, doors. There would be notice for an employment office, a flyer for a play, a reminder to be careful with fire, an advertisement for a patent medicine that might be good for hemorrhoids. None of these notices looked official, and they obviously weren't permanent. Some were worn away and half torn down. It was clear that there was no plan at work. None of the paths seemed to go very far before they stopped and veered off at right angles. Then there would be a new series of doors and a new series of bewildering signs, or suddenly a tall storehouse belonging to someone on one of the main streets. Sometimes the wells and outhouses were set up haphazardly in the middle of the pathways, but sometimes they occupied their own little clearing alongside an overflowing trash box. These were the only places where it was possible to look up and see more than a sliver of sky, but it was better to keep looking down. There were plants, baskets, toddlers, and dogs underfoot, and the ground was wet where people had been doing their laundry. It seemed that no one made any distinction between indoor and outdoor space. Tools, noises, and smells spilled out onto the pathways, and people conducted their personal business in plain sight. They went to and from the bathhouses nearly naked. And since some of the outhouses had only half doors, men urinated while talking to their neighbors. In the middle of the chaos, it was obvious that Sunino was in Edo, where else would be this crowded and loud, but it was hard to tell exactly where she was or how to get out. Was this what Sunino had come all the way from Echigo to see? Chikan didn't care. He was almost out of money, at least that's what he said. And this was the only part of the city that he could afford. The room he rented was a three mat, only six feet wide and nine feet long. A very tall man could have grazed both walls with his fingertips and two adults could barely set out their futons side by side. Even the next size up, which I think this is a four and a half mat, was unbearably cramped for more than one person. A few decades before Tsunino arrived in the city, the writer Shikite Samba joked, 
They say that someone who lives in a four and a half mat tatami room is like an inchworm, all bunched up now so they can stretch out later. This implied a kind of ambition on the part of Edo's tenement dwellers who could endure discomfort in the hope of upward mobility. In Tsuneno's case, the three mat room was the opposite, the end point of a precipitous downward slide. It was the smallest and probably the dirtiest place she had ever lived. From the packed dirt entryway, which you can see um, over here, which was just about big enough to hold two pairs of sandals, there was a step up into the main room. Inside, there was one tatami mat set lengthwise, and then beyond it, two more stretching side by side toward the back wall. Otherwise, the room was bare. Tenements didn't typically become furnished. And there was no room for furniture anyway. If Tsuneno had extra clothes, which she didn't, she would have to hang them on the walls or stack them in baskets. If she had a futon, which she didn't, she would have to roll it up and shove it in the corner. During the day, this one room would need to be the living and eating space, and it wasn't pleasant. The only light came from a window facing forward into the alley. Since most tenement houses consisted of two rows of units facing in opposite directions, the side and back walls were shared with the neighbors. The sun would have to be at exactly the right height for light to fall through the slatted window. The back of the room was permanently sunk in shadow. Behind, beside the room's entrance on the same level, there was a tiny wooden floored space that would have to serve as a kitchen for holding water buckets. Next to it was the place for cooking. It would fit a miniature charcoal brazier and maybe a box of rice. There wasn't room to cook more than one pot of rice at a time, so everything would have to be prepared well in advance or bought ready-made from peddlers. And the brazier would need accessories. After the charcoals inside were lit, Tsunino would have to use a pipe to blow on them to get them to ignite. All those things, the brazier, the pot, the pipe, the charcoal, and the boxes and buckets would have to be purchased. There were shelves on the wall next to the door, which would be useful if she ever had dishes, trays, and chopsticks. They couldn't be set on the floor. In a three mat, there was barely enough room for one person to crouch next to the brazier. Much later, Tsuneno would become accustomed to life in Edo's back alleys. She would get to know her neighbors and learn how to ignore the loud arguments that echoed through the walls. She would figure out how to stand in line at the well, how to share a toilet with dozens of strangers, and how to buy charcoal by the scoop. She would even come to prefer life in the city to her more comfortable existence in Echigo. But during her first weeks in Minagawacho, she could barely describe her situation except to say how awful it was. Tsunino was probably better off than most of her neighbors, men and women who belonged to the more stable part of Edo's lower class. A few worked as servants who didn't live in, and others were palanquin bearers who propped their palanquins outside their doors when they weren't working. Most were peddlers. They departed every morning, far more cheerfully on sunny days than on rainy ones. For hours, they made their rounds, selling things like candles, sweets, or hot peppers. Other alley dwellers used their tiny rooms for commerce. Sellers abused dishes, sat them out by the door. Teachers had pupils come in and set up their own desks. And employment agents entertained walk-in clients. But most of the tenement people were small-scale artisans. It was amazing how many different types of things people could fabricate in their back alley rooms. People were dyeing and stenciling cloth and carving woodblocks for printing. They were making wooden tools and eyeglasses. They were weaving tatami mats and smoothing boards and assembling musical instruments. They did this all in full view of the alley with their sliding doors thrown open to catch the light. These busy people kept tabs on their neighbors. They gathered around the well, at the bathhouse, and at the barber. They even chatted across the alleys when they were working. Men flung boasts and insults back and forth in narrow spaces, put upon grandmothers, criticized their daughters-in-law, and pompous old men bored everyone with peevish complaints. There was always something to say. There were people who liked to borrow things and wouldn't return them, whiny, sticky-handed children who wiped their noses on adults' kimono sleeves, no good men who spent all their family's money at brothels, lazy women who made their husbands go fetch water from the well, and haughty girls who criticized their mother's clothes. No one was immune to criticism or exempt from speculation. Buyoin Shi and Edo Samurai claimed that back alley women couldn't wait until their menfolk left for the day so that they could, quote, get together with other wives in the neighborhood or on the same row to talk about how useless their husbands are. Chikan, Tsunino's traveling companion, was certainly useless. Within weeks, he abandoned her with only one gold coin to her name. But Tsunino found a way for herself in the city. 
the story of how she did that, how she went to work as a maidservant in a samurai's mansion, how she then ended up working for the very wealthy man um, who she wrote about in that original letter that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, how she married a masterless samurai and ended up living in the scariest place in Edo, the city magistrate's office. All that is the story of the book. Along the way, it includes a famous, gang, uh, famous kabuki actor who played women's roles. So here he is there, Yui Hanshiro. An intimidating tattooed city magistrate. Here he is, um, Toyama Kagemoto. Now he doesn't look intimidating or tattooed there, but legend had it that he had tattoos like sleeves all up and down his arms. And of course, there was always Tsuneno. She was by her own admission, an extremely bad tempered person, stubborn and difficult. But that was what it took to make a life in the city in a time and a place where the odds were always against her. By the time Tsuneno died in 1853, she was a samurai woman and an Edoite through and through. As she would have seen it, her life was not heroic. She didn't contribute to the building or opening of nations or the emergence of a new era. She was one person, an individual, a woman who made choices and as she might have seen it, left very little behind. No children, no legacy, just letters. But if women like her hadn't come in from the countryside, Edo wouldn't have grown. If they hadn't washed floors, sold charcoal, kept the books, done laundry and served food, its economy could not have functioned. And if they hadn't bought theater tickets, hairpins, bolts of cloth and bowls of noodles, the Shogun's great city wouldn't have been a city at all. It would have been a dusty military outpost, full of men, one of a thousand, not worth all the effort. Tsuneno's legacy was the great city of Edo, now Tokyo, her ambition, her life's work. Her aspiration for a different kind of existence propelled her from home, and she might have said that the experience of Edo changed her. But she also shaped the city, every well she waited at, every copper coin she spent, every piece of clothing she pawned or mended, every well she waited at. The big decision to migrate and every tiny choice she made later in the days and years that followed, they made households function and sent the peddlers on their rounds. They made it possible for the city magistrate to issue his edicts. They sent the peasants out to the safflower fields in Dewa province and the wholesalers to market. They lit the lanterns in the theaters. They built the great stores. The city wasn't just a backdrop to Tsuneno's life. It was a place that she created day by day. And when she died, other women, unknown people, would take up her work. And now for a minute, I want to go back to the very beginning, the beginning of my talk and the beginning of Tsuneno's life. For most of the 10 years that I spent writing this book, I didn't know when Tsuneno was born. I got used to the idea that I would probably never know. But when I finally finished the first draft of Stranger in the Shogun City, I returned to the archive for a final fact check. I called up a document that I'd never seen, cataloged as the record of Tsuneno's older brother Giyu's birth. I flipped through dutifully and then stopped short. Hidden in the last pages, scribbled in what must have been Tsuneno's mother's or grandmother's handwriting, was another account. Third month, twelfth day, Tsuneno's birth. When I saw this, I had to turn around and pretend to look at the reference books to avoid crying all over the page. It wasn't just that I'd never known the exact date of Tsuneno's birth. It was also that after nearly a decade, I could read it. I hope that gives you some idea of what the journey of writing this book was like for me, and also some idea of what is awaiting you in its pages if you read it. So thank you so much for having me today, and I will look forward to answering your questions and hearing your thoughts. Wow, thank you. You really took me away from 2020. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need that. I'm trying to stop my share. There we are. My screen sharing is paused, but somehow I can't see my cursor. So, um, yeah. okay. Well, I'll ask you the the. We have a couple of questions, and um, okay. um, I want to ask you my question first. Sorry, everyone. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, why were Tsuneno's papers preserved? So that is a very good question. I think that if it had been up to her family, they probably would have destroyed them. 
But I think what ended up happening was that her brother was a very good record keeper. And you had to be a very good record keeper if you were the head priest of a Buddhist temple because they had to keep track of all their parishioners. Um, and part of the job of running a Buddhist temple in this period was to keep population registers. So these families were literate. Um, and they kept records of everything. And they also tended to be kind of pack rats because everything worked on precedent. You had to remember what had happened a few decades ago. You had to remember how the temple was run and who you owed money to. So they just tended to keep boxes and boxes and boxes full of papers. Not only did they keep all the letters they received, they also, kept they also kept copies of their outgoing correspondence. So they made drafts and they kept them in their own family archive. And I imagine what eventually happened is they kept all these letters from Tsunino. And the way that the letters ended up at the archive was that the family years later in the early 20th century donated all of it. And what I imagine happened is that this family had a whole storehouse full of boxes of documents that they could not read and did not have time to go through. And so they just gave it to the archive and they said, are you interested in, you know, I think it was, I can't remember how many thousand documents it was, but it's a lot of documents. Are you interested in these? And the archive said, yes. And so until the archive um, and their employees actually went through and cataloged them, nobody knew what was there. Fortunately for us. Fortunately for me, yeah. I don't know about Sineno though. That's something I think about all the time. Like, would she have liked the fact that an American went through all her stuff and wrote a book about her in English or would she have been resentful of that? Uh, Zena has two questions. Um, mm -hmm. Her first one is, was the first letter the only one that was translated? Oh, so I did the translation. So I ended up having to translate all of the letters, more or less. Um, so what I say is that the, the document um, was, it was transcribed, by which I mean, so this is something that, let's see if I have a book here. This has not been transcribed, right? That just looks like squiggles. It looks like somebody's handwriting. But when you transcribe it, it looks like, this, right? Which is like nice blocky characters that kind of look like something a human being might be able to read. So the, the archive had done that. They had transcribed the document into a format that if you read J modern Japanese, you could recognize the characters. And they had also um, included an explanation in Japanese of what the letter said and what the kind of background materials were. But the translations into English, those I had to do. And that was a task. That's why it took so long. I love the uh, duct tape dictionary. Oh, I know. And you know, I can't ever throw that dictionary away because it was a gift from my first professor in Japan. And it says, um, in, in the, it's inscribed and it says um, to Amy from Yabuta. So it's actually one of my most prized possessions, this completely disgusting falling apart dictionary. So one of the things that I would save from my house in a fire. <laughs> uh, Zina's other question is, when did your obsession with Japan begin and why? So I would say that I was obsessed with Tsuneno. I was never really obsessed with Japan, although I've always liked Japan. Um, I, when I was a kid, my father worked as a scientist at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I grew up in Maryland and he had a lab um, and his postdocs, a lot of his postdocs in the 1980s came from Japan. And his favorite postdoc, um, Masa, and his wife, Naoko, came from Tokyo when I was about 11. And they became very good friends of my family. And they would tell us stories about Tokyo and they would have us over and they would make us Japanese food. And so I became really interested in this place that they were from. And when I got to college, um, I was not able to take Japanese in high school, it wasn't offered. But when I got to college, they offered Japanese and I thought, well, this is really interesting, I should try it. Um, it turns out that J Japanese is a really difficult language, and even if you take a year of college Japanese, you are nowhere near being able to talk to people or read a newspaper. But I kind of felt like, well, I've done this for a year, I might as well do it for another year. And then after another year, I still couldn't do anything, and I thought, well, I might as well do it more. And so I ended up taking all of this Japanese, and the only way I could really fit it into my schedule and justify it was to major in East Asian studies, which I did. And since I was always interested in history, I chose the history track of East Asian studies. 
And I had a wonderful undergraduate advisor at the time. His name was Hal Belitho. And he was a really old school professor who had this book lined office um, up in the kind of upper reaches of the building that housed the East Asian Library. Um, and he was always welcoming to students. So I climbed the stairs and visit him there. And he said, Amy, you know, um, if you really want to study Japanese history, you need to study the Edo period because there's so many documents left over. You can even read people's shopping lists. And I, at the time, at the age of, I don't know, 19 or 20, thought that sounds like the most boring thing I can possibly imagine. <laughs> Who wants to read other people's shopping lists? And yet here I am, 20 whatever years later, having written this whole book, which is essentially about people's shopping lists. So that's where it started. And this is where I've ended up. That's where the raw history is, is in the-, in the it's in people's, You have to be careful. If you don't want some historian reading your shopping lists 200 years from now, you have to burn them. <laughs> um, uh, Roberta wants to know, uh, did the archives keep your English translations? No, so the archives do not have my translations. And actually there are only a few that I actually produce polished translations of. Um, that I could show you. Most of the other translations that I made for myself to use in the writing are like a complete mess of notes to myself and untranslated words. Um, the archives though have been absolutely wonderful. I mean, they have a public mission, right? Much like the Glencoe Library um, to, but their mission is not only to kind of educate the public but also to preserve the history of their area. And so they're very welcoming of me, a kind of foreign researcher who wandered in because they thought it was wonderful that somebody was interested in their materials. So not only did they prepare everything for me in, and kind of getting me all the documents that they thought I would need and showing me documents I didn't even know that I thought I would need. Um, but at one point they actually took me to their basement, which is where they keep all the documents to show me their collection of Edo period weapons. <laughs> so I was really welcomed by that archive and could not have done any of the work that I did for this book without their support and their expertise. Lovely story, thank you. Well, we have to be very appreciative of librarians and archivists, I think. <laughs> and I'm not just saying that because I'm talking to a public library. Uh, Roger would like to, hi Roger. Um, Roger would like to know um, how different would Tsuneno's life have been if she'd been born 50 years later after the Meiji Restoration? Her life would have been so entirely different. Um, so I address this a little bit at the end of my book, which is that women who were born in what would have been her granddaughter's generation, if she had had children and grandchildren, had completely different lives. Um, and in some ways, day-to-day -day life wasn't that different. I mean, you would still be spending a lot of time doing laundry, um, cooking, raising children, those things that seem to be historical continuities in many women's lives. But that was the first generation of women to travel overseas, to pursue higher education, um, to write and publish their own memoirs. Um, and I mention in the um, last chapter of my book, in the, in the conclusion, um, one of those women who was from Echigo, so from an area that was right near where Tsuneno grew up, who was born at the beginning of the Meiji period. So in that generation that you talked about, she ended her life as a professor at Columbia University in New York City. <laughs> so that's how far people traveled in one generation. Um, here, here's, uh, Deborah has a question um, and it sounds like she's read, she's read your book um, already. It says, can you address the illnesses of the time and the trouble with her eyes? Ah, yes, a medical mystery. So uh, something I didn't talk about in the talk was that when Tsuneno went to, went, ran away, she said that she was going to see her brother who was a doctor and that she was going from there to seek treatment for her eyes, which had been bothering her. Um, and all through her third marriage, she was actually ill in, in bed, we would say in the futon um, with some kind of eye disease. And she was doing very badly for a while and her brother was very concerned about her. And even when she got to Edo, she kept saying that her eyes were bothering her. Now, I had no idea what that was, some kind of conjunctivitis. Um, there's another kind of parasitic eye disease, which I'm blanking on the name, but which is very common in the Edo period that you get from, I think, contaminated water. Um, but then after that, it never comes back and it never gets mentioned in the documents again. Um, the other medical mystery is um, people keep talking about um, a disease that they call, that's 
like kind of just a general um, like winter illness that kind of like the, like the way that we might colloquially talk about the flu. Um, and they just say that people are sick with this and it just seems to be a fever. That can be any number of things um, like typhoid or um, they knew actually smallpox and measles. So some things they had actual names for, but then there was this kind of catch all category of like a disease that comes with a fever that's not measles or smallpox. Um, and that's, I think ultimately what Suneno died of, um, it's what her father died of. Um, and people are mentioned in the book as having this, but I was never, you, because there's no precision in diagnosis in the Edo period, I can't tell you what it was. And you have no idea how much this bothers my father, who is a medical doctor, <laughs> wants to know what was the problem with Sunino's eyes and what is this fever that people are getting? Is it typhoid? And I really just, I have no way of knowing. Ah, excellent. Um, any last questions? Um, oh, uh, Roberta says, I was fascinated by your book and what an outstanding job you did in taking us to that period of time. I felt like I was there. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think we all do need to get away from our present moment. And so to the extent to which I can feel make people feel like they're traveling away from the United States and back in time, I consider that to be a success. Well, as is this evening. Um, I, I want to mention that to everybody, um, the library does have a copy of this book. Um, we also have it in ebook format in case that uh, works out better for you, but um, it's making the rounds of, of um, a lot of librarians here, um, at, uh, uh, at advanced reader copy that we have and um, um, everybody loves it. So um, we recommend it. And um, thank you so much, Professor Stanley. This has been a delight. Thank you so much. I had fun and I'm just so sorry I can't see all your faces. Thanks very much. Okay, good, good night. night everyone.